So we're in discipleship class number 17, I believe. If I'm wrong about the number, please forgive me. All right, but anyway, in discipleship class, we're now in number 17. We're talking about the subject of hell. Let's talk about the origin of hell. Origin of hell. How did hell begin and start? So look at Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, all the way at the beginning. It's because of Satan's rebellion. It's because of Satan's rebellion. So due to his rebellion, that's why hell started. God created hell. Look at Isaiah chapter 14, and we will read verses 12 through 15. Notice what Lucifer himself said at verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which disweak the nations? And Lucifer starts talking at verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now look what God said when Lucifer rebelled, right? That was the beginning of Lucifer's rebellion. Verse 15, yet thou shalt be brought down to where? Hell. Now look at Matthew 25. Matthew 25. So that's why hell was created. It started with Lucifer's rebellion. Go to Matthew chapter 25 and we will read verse 41. Matthew chapter 25. And we will read verse 41. Notice that God Almighty, he said that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. It was not prepared for sinners. Sinners, us humans, hell it was not prepared for. It was prepared for Satan. Look at Matthew 25, verse 41. The word of God reads, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. Prepared for who? The devil and his angels. So there's no doubt that hell was created because of Lucifer and the angels who fell that time due to their sin. 2 Peter 3, 9, please. 2 Peter 3, 9. You understand God doesn't want men to burn in hell. God doesn't want men to burn in hell. That's why hell was not created for you. It was created for Satan and his minions. Like at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, I will abbreviate, I will paraphrase that. The word of God says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, God does not want people to burn in hell. So you can see that he did not create hell for mankind. It was intended for Lucifer and the fallen angels. Now, look at Psalms chapter 9 and verse 17. Psalms 9, 17. And then I'm going to read Romans 3, 23 as well. Now, the reason why sinners go to hell, this is the reason why. Because of sin. So because humans are contaminated with sin, that's why we go to hell. That's the reason why we go to hell. So even though it was intended for the devil and his angels, because of sin, we followed the devil and his minions in their sin, God has no choice but to cast us into hell. Psalms 9, 17, the wicked shall be turned, see that, into hell. And then Romans 3, 23 says, for all have sinned, that's why, what does it say? And come short of the glory of God. We fall short of God's glory in heaven and we cannot go in because of our sins. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 9, please. Isaiah chapter 14 and we will read verse 9. So one thing to understand about hell is that it's down in the earth. It's down in the earth. So it is not located at some separate plane out of uh, some other dimension, yada, yada, yada. No, it is actually in a geographical location. It is below our feet. Now, the two verses that proves this is Ezekiel 32, 27, Isaiah 14, verse 9, as well as Proverbs chapter 15, and then verse 24. Now, we're not going to look at all three passages. We're, all, we're just going to look at one of them. So we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 9. Notice what God says concerning where the location of hell lies. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. See that? It's below us. 
And then Ezekiel chapter 32 and verse 27. I'll quickly turn over there and read it. It says, And they shall not lie with the mighty that are fallen of the uncircumcised, which are gone down to hell. See that? So notice that the location is below our feet. Also Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 24, it reads, The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell. Where? Beneath. It's below our feet. That's where hell lies. Okay, now Christ, he went to hell during his death, you don't understand. He did go down to hell. We're going to look at several passages concerning this. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 31. Acts chapter 2 and verse 31. Now the second passage, you don't have to turn there, but the second passage will be Matthew chapter 12, and it will be verse 40, Matthew chapter 12, and it will be verse 40. Now notice what the Word of God reads right here, that Christ, He did go down to hell for us. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 31. Now it's important to understand that Jesus Christ did not go down to hell to fry and to burn. That's a heresy. Jesus Christ, when he went down to hell, he was preaching to the damned at hell. He wasn't burning and frying. Look at Acts 2, verse 31. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. And then Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, what Jesus said was that he would be in the heart of the earth. Now remember, what's at the heart of the earth? hell, right? Remember? We talked about that. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, which you don't have to turn to, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. Notice the location in the heart of the earth. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46. Hell is known to be as a place of punishment. So we're not going to turn there for time's sake, but Matthew 25, 46 says that uh, everlasting punishment, that's what it says in Matthew 25, 46 for hell. Luke chapter 16 and verse 23, Luke chapter 16 and verse 23 says hell is a place of torment. It is a place of torment. So it's not just a normal place. It is a place where you literally burn and you're tormented. It's also a place of fire, a place of fire. So, hell is not the grave. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 9. Matthew 18, 9. Notice that hell is a place of literal fire. It's not the grave, like Jehovah Witnesses will like to say. It is a place of wailing and gnashing of teeth. So, literally, you gnash your teeth so much in pain and you're wailing. Now, you might say, how is that possible that you gnash your teeth? Usually in cold temperatures, you gnash your teeth, not in hot temperatures. You're right, but because hell is such an extreme place of bitter pain, you literally are in so much in pain, you gnash your teeth. You ever grit your teeth in pain before? So this one is going to be so bad that you're going to be gnashing. Matthew chapter 22, verse 13, it shows it's a place of outer darkness. Outer darkness. So, wow, how can... Fire produced darkness. Isn't it supposed to show light? Well, hell, it's going to be like black fire. There are some people who say because of the black substance of black fire, it becomes very dark. So you see right here, hell, hell is extremely hot. Black fire is actually one of the hottest temperatures, hottest fiery torments. Another thing is Mark chapter 9 and verse 43 through 44. It is a place of literal worms. You might say, wait, do you mean that? Yes, literally there will be insects crawling all over you. How many people hate being in a garbage can? It is a place of no end, no end. Now, literally there's no time in hell and you'll be burning for all eternity. Man, no ending and you want an end. Hell is also a place where you will burn together with the devil and his angels. You'll be together with him. I mean, there are so many people that says, I want to party with the devil. Well, hey, if that's what you want, then the Lord will have you burn together with Satan. That's found at Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41. 
And then the final thing, uh, I pray that's the final thing, actually. Hell is already nasty enough, isn't it? Here's an important verse. Go to Isaiah 5.14. Isaiah 5.14. Didn't you know hell can grow? I don't know if you knew that. Hell can grow even bigger. Well, how are you going to fit everyone in there? That's no problem. God, all he has to do is increase hell. You ever wonder why volcanic eruptions get even worse and worse nowadays? One more soul dropped into hell. One more soul dropped into hell. Now, before you think that hell is a joke and that hell is a party, I think you should change your mind after looking at all those verses. When you look at all those verses, you realize it's no joke. Isaiah 5.14, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. No measurements. Now look at Proverbs 27.20. Proverbs chapter 27, Proverbs chapter 27, and verse 20, verse 20. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 20. So you'll notice right here that with hell, that it can grow even bigger. So it is no problem with how many souls drop into hell, literally billions. So you got to realize this. Hell is something that you should take seriously. Why don't a lot of preachers talk about this, pastor? Very simple. Look how horrible it is. I don't want to hear about this teaching, Pastor. Well, trust me, you'd want to hear it if you're burning in hell when you're lost in sin. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 20. Hell and destruction are never what? Full. Now look at Psalms chapter 9 and verse 17. Psalms chapter 9, verse 17. Now let's cover the names of hell. We're going we're gonna to be covering the different names of hell. You might say, hell has different names? Yeah, it does. Now, we're not going to turn to all of these verses, but I'm going to list you out the names of hell. So let's write over here the names. What is hell called in the Bible? It has many different names. One of them is called Sheol. Sheol. That's Hebrew, the Hebrew translation. Psalms 9.17. I believe it says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. It's also called Hades, Hades in Greek. That's a Greek word. That will be found, you don't have to turn there, is Revelation chapter 20 and verse 13. Now before Jehovah Witnesses will pull the punchline on you that uh, Hades is the grave, it's not literal hell fire, this verse will say that Hades is cast into fire. It's also called Gehenna, Gehenna. Now I'll be found at Mark chapter 9 and verse 47. Mark 9, 47. Hell is also called Gehenna. Hell is also called death or second death. This is very important to understand because you're going to notice throughout the whole Bible, it will mention about an eternal damnation, yet it's called death. And some people don't understand that. Why is it called that? Because it's an eternal death. See that? It's an eternal death. It's called a second death. It's not like ordinary deaths. And you got to realize this. Death in our physical plane has an end. But this death is eternal. So you're going to see die, dead, and death all over. And when you see that throughout the Bible, you're going to realize that it can refer to burning in hell forever, not just ending your life. It's also called destruction destruction so whenever you see in the bible about destruction realize it's it may not just refer to physical destruction it could refer to an eternal spiritual destruction which is hellfire it's also called wrath of god wrath of god that's why you got to realize this if whenever in the bible it says god sheds his wrath do you think that he's kidding around I mean, he likens it to hell, you got to understand. That's another name for hell, the wrath of God, where you burn forever and ever. That's what it is. So when the Bible talks about God shedding wrath, you got to realize this. It's going to be something that's not pretty, and you don't want to tempt the Lord with that. It's also called lake of fire, lake of fire. So Jehovah Witnesses, they believe in a lake of fire, but they don't believe in hell. 
that you can point out right over here that Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, well, whether you believe or not that hell has fire, you at least believe that there is a torment of fire in the afterlife. It doesn't change that fact. Now we're going to talk about the different compartments in hell. There are two passages. Go to Matthew 23 and Psalms chapter 86. Look at Matthew 23 and Psalms chapter 86. So what we're going to discover right here is that hell has different compartments. you got to realize this. It's not just one location where people burn. There are many different compartments in hell. So there are different places, different locations. And I'm sure some people are wondering, man, what, what kind of places lie within hell? Well, there's a place of torment, and this might be surprising to you, but there's also a place of comfort within hell. It's not just completely torment. There's a location where there's a place of comfort. That's where Old Testament saints used to go, and I'm going to be covering that a little bit later on. But hell, it, it's not just a place, remember, where lost sinners burn for eternity. It is a place for who? The devil and his angels originally, correct? So you're going to find out different places in hell where it's reserved for the fallen angels you're going to find out. There's a place located for the devil and his angels. And even Judas Iscariot has his own little place in hell. I don't know if you realize that. So let's cover the different compartments in hell. Now, when we cover the different compartments in hell, it is important to understand that when there are different compartments, it means that there are different levels of burning. So a lot of people, they will say, well, I don't believe that a person who lived her life so much in good works is burning in the same hell as Adolf Hitler and Ted Bundy. Well, you got to realize this. Yeah, they're burning in the same place, but they're burning at different levels. It's like prison, right? They go to prison, but they serve different sentences. They have different levels of punishment. Not only that, in the prison system here in our countries, they have different types of prison for people to be punished within. So you got to realize this, is that if mankind has that much common sense that crimes have to have penalty crimes must be punished yet there are different levels of kind of punishment why do you think that god doesn't have the common sense to realize that too sin has to be punished it must have a penalty no matter how much good works you did in your life sin is sin but god has enough common sense to put different levels of punishment look at matthew chapter 23 and verse 14 the word of god reads right here one to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the what? Greater damnation. Psalms 86 and verse 13, which your hand is already there. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Lowest hell. Now let's look at Luke chapter 16, please. Go to Luke chapter 16. Hell has another compartment it's called abraham's bosom abraham's bosom this is a place of comfort you gotta understand it's not a place of torment you'll notice that right before uh, jesus died on the cross before jesus died on the cross where can the people in the old testament go so luke 16 common sense that's before jesus died on the cross so this will show where people, before Jesus died on the cross, where they went to in the afterlife. Look at Luke chapter 16, verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So this is a saint that went into a place of comfort. The rich man also died and was buried. And in where? Hell. So the rich man is in hell, but look where he sees. He sees who? Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. How can a person in the center of the world where hell lies see heaven? Unless this place of comfort, Abraham's bosom, is in the same location and you can see from a distance. See that? So Abraham's bosom, you got to realize this, it says in hell as well. The verse says in hell. So in hell he sees, he communicates with Abraham. 
So Abraham's bosom, a place of comfort in hell. That's where they went. Now, if you keep looking at Luke 16, look at verses 25 through 26. 25 through 26. This definitely proves Abraham's bosom was in the same location as hell because there was a great gulf that was right between them. So they were right across from each other. Look at Luke chapter 16. I put 25. There's no such thing as chapter 25. Luke 16, verses 25 through 26. Notice what it says. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, see Abraham's bosom, place of comfort where Lazarus is, and the rich man, there is a what? Great gulf fixed. Also look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Uh, the other place is Judas Iscariot. It will literally say his own place. His own place. Now we're going to look at several passages to prove this. So we're going to look at several interesting passages. I want you to go to about four of them probably. Acts 1, 25. Go to Acts 1. Acts 1. And then the second one, go to John 17. John 17. The other one, go to Revelation 17. Revelation 17. And that is it, thankfully. So just those three passages. Yeah, just three. Just three. Not a lot, right? <laughs> go to Acts chapter 1, and we will read verse 25. Acts 1, 25. So... Let me review the three passages again so you can have some time to look. Acts 1, John 17, John 17, and the other one is Revelation 17, Revelation 17. So again, John 17, Revelation 17. All right, so I'm going to launch off and read now. You ready? So let's read several of the passages right here. Acts chapter 1 and verse 25. Notice it says, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to where? His own place. When he died, he went to his own place. Now jump to John 17, verse 12. Your hand's already there, right? So let me read it off the bat. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost. Now notice when Jesus says to God, these disciples you gave to me, none of them is lost, right? Except one, but the son of perdition. So notice right here, this is proof that Judas Iscariot is called the son of perdition because Jesus said, none of these disciples I've lost, except he calls him son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Ah, scripture fulfilled, huh? Remember Acts 125? He might go to his own place that it will fulfill the scripture, actually, which you're going to find out at verse uh, 19 and 20 of Acts 1. But forget that. Go to Revelation 17, right? Go to Revelation 17. Point is this. Point is, Judas Iscariot, he went to his own place. And then he's called son of perdition. Now look at this now. Then that means, look at Revelation 17, verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was. Now remember, the beast is the Antichrist. The beast is also called, if you know a little bit about your Bible, who is the beast called? He's called son of perdition. Then that means, wait a minute, preacher, then you're saying if the beast is called son of perdition, Judas Iscariot is called son of perdition, that means Judas, uh, Judas Iscariot is the beast. He's the Antichrist. Correct. So Judas Iscariot, what's going on is that he's in his own place. And when Revelation 17 that tribulation starts hitting, guess what happens? The Antichrist, he comes out of the, his own place, he comes out of hell, and then arrives to the world and says, peace be unto you, I am the Messiah. Ain't that wild? Look at verse 8, if you don't believe me. That thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend. See, he's coming out of where? The bottomless pit, and go into where? Ooh, perdition. Remember, son of perdition, Judas Iscariot? Ooh, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. See that? I told you so. I told you so. 
Now, the other one is called bottomless pit. Bottomless pit. So there's another location in hell. It's called bottomless pit. That's Revelation chapter 20. Turn to Revelation chapter 20, please. Revelation chapter 20. The second passage, you're not going to turn there, but the second passage is Numbers chapter 16, verse 30 through 33. We're not going to turn there, though. Go to Revelation chapter 20, and we will read verse 1. Notice, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit. Okay, but who's in there? And a great chain is in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit. So you'll notice right here that that's the location where Satan goes toward. Where Satan goes, his location will be called the bottomless pit. Now, do you know who also went to the pit, which is very interesting? Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Those three people who rebelled against Moses. Numbers chapter 16, verse 30, it says right here, but if the Lord make a new thing and the, oath, the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And then verse 31, 32, the earth opened up and they fell in. This proves that the bottomless pit is located in hell. It's located underneath the earth. Now the Probably the most interesting location in hell. Go to 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2. It's Tartarus. Tartarus. In our King James Bible, because it translates to English, the English translation is obviously hell. But you'll notice that in this location in hell, it's not lost sinners. It's a totally different location for totally different beings. These are fallen angels. That's why when you look at the Greek version of it, the Greek version, it calls it Tartarus, Tartarus. So to make it more specific, we will call it Tartarus right here. The accurate English translation, however, is hell. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For God spare not the angels that sin. See that? These angels who sin, where they go? But cast them down into hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Look at that. These fallen angels are in hell. The Greek will call it Tartarus, the Greek version of it. And in Tartarus, they are locked up in chains until the final judgment when these angels are called out, these fallen angels, and they will be judged. Now let's talk about the big one. This one is very important. Objections to hell. This one you have to know. This is a basic doctrine that you have to know. If you don't know this, you will not do well to answer. Go to Hebrews chapter, uh, let's see right here. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. The first objection is that God is a God of love. Okay? But the thing is this. It is true God is a God of love, but you got to realize this. God has attributes that are balanced. He has positive attribute and a negative attru attribute. He's not some kind of positive, lovey fluff. He's, got, he's a person like you and I who has positive and negative attributes. So he has love, but this does not neglect his wrath as well. He has a negative attribute of wrath. You're going to look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29. Okay, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. That's his name. His name is love. It does not make sense. It's so inconsistent that hell would be attributed equals love. No, you got to realize this. He has many names, many attributes. His name is love, yes. And his attribute is love. But also look at verse 29. For our God is love, like 1 John. No, a consuming fire. Yo, look at that. All right, here's the second argument that they're going to pull up. Is there any need of eternal punishment? Because isn't it easier to say that all sin is paid for like purgatory? Sin is paid eventually. So it does not make sense that sin 
is going to be paid forever. Won't all sins be paid for eventually? Well, look at Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And then you're going to look at Matthew 3, 12, which don't turn to, don't turn to Matthew 3, 12, but go to Romans 6, 23. Romans 6, 23. Notice that the price of sin is not temporary. It's not going to be like purgatory where you burn up for a while and sin is paid for. Now, this is a discipleship basic doctrine. Remember that. So if you don't have these verses marked down and known, then don't blame me and don't act confused when a person starts to argue against you and you don't have an answer. That's why these discipleship classes are here for you. It's for you to write these things down and to know. It's your time to shine. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin, the price of sin is what? Death. Now, keep reading. This death is eternal because it says the gift of God is what? Eternal life. So it's the context is eternity. It's not temporal. But if you don't believe me, Matthew 3.12, which you should have written down, although you're not there, it says, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. See that? It's unquenchable. It's nonstop. Nonstop. It's forever. Now, go to Deuteronomy 32. De Deuteronomy 32. Now, the answer to this one, obviously, is going to be no. It shows eternal. Eternal. Here's the other argument right here, or question. It's too cruel. Well, let's be honest. I don't think even Adolf Hitler would torture someone that long. I mean, I'm sure, like, after, what, two million years or something like that, the person will let him go? So, yes, it, it does sound like that God seems very unfair. And not only that, let's just be honest, he's cruel. No one in his or her right mind would do something awful like that. That's why the atheists, they will put up these arguments on you. How can you call God a God of love when he does something so inhumane like that? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4, what you're going to find out right here is that God is fair and won't do anything wrong to save a soul from hell. So look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. He is a rock. He is the rock. His work is is what? Perfect. Perfect. Now, here's the answer to this. In all of his works, notice it's what? Perfect, correct? Yeah. His works are perfect. Yeah. Works are your actions, what you do yeah. in life. So before people say, oh, that's not a good work for salvation, good work. No, anything that you do is counted work. Even getting inside a tub, that's something you do. Okay, but anyway, aside from that, you'll notice right here, keep reading, it says, for all his ways are what? Judgment. judgment. So this includes his judgment. His works, which includes judgment, is perfect. Perfect does not mean 90% or 80%. Perfect means 100%. So let's use some common sense. Is God perfect in his works of forgiveness. Yes. Does that mean he forgives 90% or 100%? 100%. Including his judgment, will it be 90% or 100%? 100%. What is more perfect judgment than eternal burning in hell, eternally paying for your sins? And what's more perfect forgiveness than eternal forgiveness that will wipe all your sins away? Yeah, amen. See that? Because God has to be perfect Humans are imperfect. That's why when we do the works, when we do the judgment, when we do the forgiveness, it's imperfect. It will be unfair. But God, because he's perfect, you can't tell him what to do because he knows the boundary lines. He knows every detail of man's heart. His heart is perfect, whereas you're not. So as a perfect God, his works will be different from humans in being temporal, in being uh, not eternal. It's going to be Perfect. Perfect. Because God is temporal or eternal? He's eternal. So here's another argument. Why can't he just forgive the soul who's, born, for, who's burning in hell? Oh, I forgive you and you can get out of hell. I thought God is a forgiving God. Now look at Luke 16. 
Luke chapter 16. That's not how it works, friend. Look at Luke chapter 16, verse 24 through 27. That's not how it works. Because you know why? God is an honest judge. Now, this honest judge is going to be perfect in his judgment, right? Thus, it will be eternal. So, as an honest judge, you got to understand this. Do honest judges let people slide and get away with the crime that they've committed? No, he doesn't. As an honest judge, he has to cast the judgment. Otherwise, it's breaking the law and the judge should not be a judge at all because he has to cast judgment. That's why God, he can't just forgive and let you go. He has to punish it as an honest judge. Look at verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Right? Forgive me. Get out of here. Look at verse 25 through 27. Did he get his forgiveness or was he denied? He was denied. See, so God just doesn't let people slide. He does not let people slide for a crime they commit. He's going to let them burn in hell forever. Now, here's another thing. Isn't that still unjust for one sin? It's unjust that a person will burn in hell forever for one sin. Here's the thing right here. Remember, God has to be perfect in his judgment. So as a perfect, thorough judgment, it's going to be eternal. But then when a person commits one sin, let's be honest, the same kind of sentence and judgment as Adolf Hitler, Ted Bundy, it doesn't make sense. Ah, remember, we covered somewhere back here. What did it show right here before? Matthew 23, 14. We read it before. You shall receive the greater damnation see that so you got to realize this everlasting punishment does not mean equal punishment there are degrees of everlasting punishment levels of everlasting punishment in hell now here's what they're going to say the sixth argument everlasting does not mean everlasting <laughs> what really <laughs> everlasting does not mean forever Okay, go to Romans 16, 26. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. Romans 16, verse 26. And then the other verse we won't turn to, but write it down. And those of you who have notes, you're the fortunate ones. John 3, 16. John 3, 16. It's written out there for you. That's why I write all this out as much as I can. I don't write every single verse, but I write as much as I can so you people can keep up with us. All right, now look at Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16 and verse 26. Okay, let's assume that everlasting doesn't mean forever. Romans 16, 26. The word of God reads right here, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of who? Everlasting God. God is not forever. We got to understand that fact. He's not forever. No religion would teach that actually. Not even Hindus or even Muslims. They believe in an everlasting God. John 3, 16. If you really deny this, and they're going to pull up verses where it says everlasting, and they'll try to prove right here, notice it says everlasting, but it doesn't mean forever. That's what they're going to do. Now, the simple debunking to that argument, actually, this is not in your notes, but the simple debunking to that argument is that in the context, it's a human speaking about a human place. Everlast, see that? So thus, it is forever in the human life. See that? In the human life, it lasts all the way. But you got to realize, in God's life, in the afterlife, there is no ending right there. Thus, it lasts ever throughout the entirety of God's life. But if they deny that, John 3.16 is the easiest. It says, for God so loved the world, whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is how you stomp the Jehovah Witness, Seventh-day Adventist. Okay, this is how you stomp them. Uh, you know, your kingdom here on earth or up in heaven, it's only temporary. It's not forever. Oh, no, no, no. It's forever because the verse is everlasting. Okay, if you believe that's everlasting, then why, when God says it's everlasting torment and everlasting fire, you say that's temporary. You're picking and choosing. 
You're picking and choosing. Make your afterlife as a saved person temporary if you're going to make this temporary. The next argument that you're going to see from the critics is that it's just the grave. It's just the grave. Well, in Luke chapter 16, it doesn't really show that because uh, we're not going to turn over there, but we already read some of the verses in the passage. Remember, it says the rich man died and was buried, so he's in the grave. But then it says when he opened his eyes, obviously people don't open their eyes in the grave. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes being in torments. Well, that's not the grave. There's a separation with the grave and hell right here. There's no doubt about that. Another one is Mark chapter 9, verse 45. Turn to Mark chapter 9 and verse 45. They're going to also claim that hell is just a state. It's not a place. Well, I beg to differ. These two verses debunked everlasting. This verse, excuse me, I shouldn't cross this out. What am I doing? In Luke 16, Luke 16, it debunked the grave notion and it's going to debunk the state notion. It's not just a conscious thing. It's a place of conscious, uh, utter guilt, a state of utter guilt. It's not a state. It's a literal place. P-L-A-C-E. Place, place, place. If you don't believe me, look at Mark 9, 45. Notice it is a place of literal torment. A place of literal torment. I don't think God was seeing right here. It's a phase that you're going through. It's a state of the mind. Look at Mark 9, 45. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to, en to, enter, halt, to enter halt into life than having two feasts to be cast into hell, into there that never shall be quenched. Okay, so here's another argument right here. They're going to say, so I'm very surprised uh, I have here nine, so I'm going to make this smaller because I don't have much room here. Ten, eleven, and twelve, okay? I'm going to put it like this. Hopefully people will read it from here. But they're going to say it's a shield, it's Hades, it's Gehenna, it's not hell. How many of you heard of those arguments from Jehovah Witnesses before? It's not hell, it's not hell, it's Sheol, it's Hades, it's Gehenna. The easy debunking to that is you don't need a verse. Those are translations, okay? That's not English, those are translations. Another thing is that they're going to claim, the Jehovah Witnesses, they're going to claim it's lake of fire, not hell. Okay, whatever. Because look at, look at this answer right here. The answer is, is in Revelation 20, verse 14. Turn over there. Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. Okay, who cares? You know why? You can call it lake of fire all you want. But you know what it says? Hell is cast into the lake of fire. Isn't that what it said at Revelation 20, 14? Yeah, so it doesn't change the fact. Okay, lake of fire. You just admit it. Fire, fire, fire. It doesn't change that fact. Another thing right here is that because you go to the lake of fire, you'll be annihilated. That's what they claim. You will be annihilated. So, wait, are they serious, Pastor? Yeah, you don't burn forever. You just go in the fire and poof, you're gone, like a puff of smoke. But if you look at Revelation chapter 14 and verse 11, we won't turn over there for time's sake, but Revelation 14, 11, it says the lake of fire is what? Smoke of their torment. So this is crossed out, annihilation. The torment ascended up day and night forever and ever. That's what it says. The final argument is that it's unloving. It's unloving. So for you to preach about hell, you have no love at all. Well, uh, I beg to differ because if you look at Mark chapter 9 and Matthew 23, just read the whole chapters in your spare time and call Jesus unloving after that. He preached more about hell than any other person in the Bible. Did you realize that? Amen. So don't call me unloving until you call Jesus unloving first. Yeah. All right, your homework assignment will be posted after this video. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll dismiss tonight's discipleship with your blessing. I pray that we've been armed with Scripture, knowing how to approach heresies, yeah. and that we take this doctrine of hell seriously so that we can warn the lost and show them how to get saved in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great, then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.